In the introductory segment, we showed the long roadmap that leads us from a business situation to an actual decision or recommendation, which is the goal of our course. Today, we want to look at the first steps along that path, developing a problem statement from the, the situation and turning it into a model, then eventually to a spreadsheet. A tool that we're going to use for that purpose is something called an influence diagram, so we'll build an example of that. We can't really say that we understand a problem or have a defined problem statement until we have the answers to three questions. And it's a good practice to start any of these exercises that we do in the course with these three questions. Number one, what is the goal? What are we trying to accomplish? And by that I mean what characteristic that is quantifiable are we trying to make larger or smaller? It sounds really simple, but it's actually a little bit harder than it sounds. Secondly, we have to ask ourselves what things we're going to allow ourselves to change in order to get to that goal. There are a lot of things you could change, but only a few of them matter, and sometimes how you define them matters. And later on, we'll see examples of how you could choose different uh, decision variables to, to frame a problem. Some choices will be better than others. And finally, what are the limits that are placed on our ability to do whatever it is we want to do with these decision variables? Not all problems will have constraints. They're not necessary for, for every situation, but they are actually very common. As I've discussed in class, goals and constraints are often interchangeable, and it's kind of confusing sometimes, attempting to lump them together, but, but we can't do that. For example, in the same situation, we could define two problems, one being, for example, to maximize customer service subject to our budget, the other being to minimize our expenditures to achieve a minimum level of customer service. Those two things come from the same situation, but they're subtly different problems and they lead to different solutions. So deciding which problem statement is right for your situation is a matter of context and a matter of thinking things through to see where, where it is you want to come out. A tool that we're going to use to, to help us sort out what our problem statement should be and then ultimately to turn it into a, a more usable model um, we're going to use the influence diagram and we'll show an example now of, of, of how we build one. Fundamentally what we're trying to do with an influence diagram is to show how the different pieces of the puzzle fit together. What aspects of it affect what other aspects. And if you're really trying to sort out a big mess, sometimes it's something you scratch out on a piece of paper. You start noting down the, the things that you care about and drawing little lines to show how they're connected to each other. The arrows that we draw in these diagrams show the direction of influence between different um, characteristics of the problem. Uh, you know, for example, revenue will influence profit, but profit doesn't influence revenue. So we would draw the arrow going from revenue to profit. The influence diagram also defines the boundaries of our model because we don't include a lot of minor details that really don't have any effect on the problem and by definition we're excluding those from our model. So the scope of the diagram reflects the scope of the model that we want to analyze. Influence diagrams are a lot like um, flowcharts for software developers. If you're really good at it you can skip over them in many cases but it's usually a good practice to go back to basics and, and formulate one. Okay, drawing an influence chart or diagram, there are a couple of conventions that we try to observe. Fundamentally, we want to, to work from left to right, but we build it from right to left. On the right-hand side of the chart, we'll have our goals, uh, outputs of the model, if you like, and the convention is to use an octagon or a stop sign to show where the, where the model ends. And on the left-hand side of your model, we're going to have the decisions that we input to the model. These will be typically shown as rectangles with uh, blank spaces that we're going to have to fill in at some point. In between, we're going to have a number of intermediate uh, quantities. They will be either data that has to come in from the outside world, which are represented by triangles, or intermediate variables that we calculate along our way to getting to the, to the final goal. And we put these intermediate variables in ovals. The, the building of it, as I said, typically works from, from right to left. We know where we want to wind up. If that's where the problem statement comes in. You know what your goal is. So we start with that, and we start decomposing that measure into the things that actually make it up directly. And in many cases, these are going to be intermediate variables that, 
are really not important to us but in themselves, but we need to do them to show how we get from, from A to B, so to speak. So we keep working our way back from right to left until ultimately we get back to the things that we actually get to decide about. So we have a complete diagram that maps our choices onto the final uh, goal or output. As a matter of good design, we should only have quantities appearing a single time in the influence diagram, and that will carry over when we put it into a spreadsheet. We only want information or quantities to be represented once in a spreadsheet. Let's take a very simple example. Uh, the question here is to determine the price to set for a single product to determine to, to generate the highest possible profit in, in the coming period. So already this is a pretty well-structured problem. We don't have to, to do too much fishing around to get this in the right form. We know what our goal is. The goal is to maximize profit. We know what the decision variable is. There's only one. It's the price that we're allowed to set. Presumably everything else is given or already de determined. And there are no constraints expressed on this problem. Probably we don't need any, but uh, we could add them in later if it turns out that they're necessary. So we really don't have to do too much head scratching to figure out what the problem statement is here, but we can put this into an influence diagram and see how all the moving pieces relate to each other. So let's start with our objective. We want Profit is a thing we're trying to maximize, so we'll draw a little octagon around that as a stop sign. We'll put that over on the right-hand side of the page. Now we start to think about what drives profit. Well, obviously our pricing decision does in some way, but not directly. What comes in between? Well, the simplest approach, and there's no really right or wrong way here, but the um, most logical way in, in our case would be to decompose it into a revenue side and a cost side. So, okay, we can say profit equals revenue minus cost. That's pretty straightforward. And now we've got some intermediate variables that we are going to have to calculate from further data. So let's uh, keep decomposing it as we go from, from right to left. Let's look at the bottom first, and we'll look at, at cost. It, it may or may not be appropriate for your situation, but we can choose to decompose total cost into fixed and variable. So in this case, by the way it's been drawn here, we're operating on the assumption that fixed costs are something we don't have any control over. The corporate controller tells us what they are, and that's, that's what they are. So we put them in as a triangle. That's, that's a given piece of data. In fact, we don't even need to know that if we want to maximize our profit. We just need to know it if we want to know what the absolute value of that profit is, which we usually do. Variable cost, on the other hand, is something that probably is going to be affected by our decisions. So we draw it as an oval, as another intermediate uh, variable that we're going to calculate. So what drives variable cost? Well, in a simple-minded way, we can say it would be quantity sold times unit cost. So that will give us our total variable cost for the, for the period. Now I want you to notice that there's a, an assumption baked into this that's really kind of subtle but important. We're assuming that the variable cost is driven by quantity sold. And that would be the case if you're buying product or building product to order. If you're buying or building to stock, that's a different matter. If you're buying stuff to put on the shelf, then the, the cost is driven not by the quantity you sell, but by the quantity you, you buy or make. That's a subtle distinction and one that you want to keep in mind. In this case, we're assuming we just buy or make stuff as we need it, so quantity sold does in fact directly generate variable cost. That's not always going to be the case. All right, we're still working our way back to the left. We haven't had any decision variables yet, but if we look at this, we can see that uh, the price comes into this, uh, it certainly affects the top side, the, the revenue part of the, the equation. As long as we have quantity sold and we have price, we can determine total revenue. So all the intermediate uh, variables now are uh, present. There's nothing there that, that's missing from this model in order to get us from, from price to profit. But this is a good example of how you have to think things through. It probably doesn't take a lot of thought in this case to recognize that there's a missing link here. It's not always going to be true, but it is in, in this case, that the price you set is probably going to have some influence on the quantity you sell. And the effect on quantity sold is going to be determined by some sort of external parameter that we'll call price elasticity.
So while this diagram is pretty simple, you do have to think pretty carefully about how all the pieces fit together and what the linkages might be. So this is kind of a, a first cut at, at the situation. And if you want to get more complicated, you can start thinking that, well, maybe unit cost is not constant over a large range. Maybe that's affected by the quantity sold. Yes, that's probably a, a viable model, but it's also probably more complex than we need for right now. So knowing when to stop is kind of a matter of judgment. Nobody can really tell you that you're, you're right or wrong on that. It really depends on what you know about the situation and how you're framing the problem. Certainly this tool, sketching these things out in this way, gives you a, a good way of seeing all the parts and checking to see whether you've missed any linkages or any components. Okay, so what we have now is actually a pretty good representation of our problem statement, but we haven't yet made it into a model. So we need three more things, basically. First of all, going back to all these triangles here, these are bits of data or information that we have to get from the outside world. And as long as they're available, then we can create a model that will allow us to input a price and calculate a profit. The next thing we have to have is some sort of mathematical relationship between the elements. So going back to the model again, it's very easy to see, for example, that profit equals revenue minus cost. So that's a very simple arithmetic uh, relationship. Likewise, total cost is equal to total variable cost plus total fixed cost. That's pretty simple. Total revenue is equal to price times quantity sold. That's also fairly simple. Quantity sold is some sort of function of price, but it may not be a simple function. The price elasticity may be linear or may be expressed in a, a logarithm or, or exponential form. So the relationship here may be a little bit more complex than, than some of the others we're looking at. But fundamentally, if this is to be a working model, we need to be able to put some number in here for price and bang, have a number pop out here for profit. That's the essence of a model. Finally, we have to look and see if there are any constraints on this model that would limit what we can do. This particular model will probably have a natural maximum. It doesn't have to have constraints in order to work, but you may also discover that the maximum profit is achieved at some ridiculous levels of, of production or sales quantity. And you may have uh, physical constraints on how much you can produce and sell in a period, in which case you would have to add that in as a, an external bound on your, on your model. And we'll see how we do that with a, with a spreadsheet later on. A constraint is not really one of the moving parts of a model. It's simply a, a, a barrier that you put up along the way to ensure that values don't cross into unacceptable regions. So we do need to keep our constraints and our goals separate, uh, but they come together when we do a spreadsheet analysis. So once we fill in those things, then we actually have a very good model that translates to a spreadsheet. Because basically every element of that influence diagram is going to represent a cell on your spreadsheet model. And if you've done this right, you also almost by default have a pretty good spreadsheet design. So if you have a logical flow from the decision variable to outcome, you have data points only entered once in the, in the model, it all translates to a, a good working spreadsheet. And that's something we'll be looking at in future examples.